Hello, everybody, and welcome. Today's webinar is a discussion with glaucoma patient and advocate, filmmaker Joe Lovett, and clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst Deborah Waxenberg. The psychosocial issues of glaucoma that so dramatically affect patients' quality of life are rarely addressed in glaucoma care as they have been in other medical situations, such as cancers, Alzheimer's, and AIDS. How can glaucoma affect professional and personal life? How does stress impact glaucoma? What techniques can reduce anxiety? What should you look for in a therapist? We will explore these and other questions about living with glaucoma. I'm Elena Sturman. I am the president and CEO of the Glaucoma Foundation. Since our founding in 1984, the Glaucoma Foundation has been dedicated to improving the lives of people with glaucoma. We fund researchers who are working to unlock the mysteries of these diseases and find the keys to the preservation of vision and reversal of blindness. We encourage innovation and communication between scientists and clinicians around the world, including bringing specialists in other fields to work on the problem of glaucoma. And we provide news and education to hundreds of thousands of people in the US and abroad through our website, newsletters, and webinars such as this one. Many of you already know Joe Lovett. You may have seen his documentary, Going Blind, Coming Out of Dark About Vision Loss, which we aired for you in 2020. Joe created this film in 2010 to learn for himself how others live with vision loss. What developed is an inspiring and uplifting journey alongside people who have lost some or all of their sight. It is also Joe's personal story of his struggle with glaucoma and his sometimes difficult journey through what he calls the secret world of vision rehabilitation. Joe is a long-standing advocate for patients and a great friend of the Glaucoma Foundation. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Elena. Dr. Deborah Waxenberg is with us for the first time. She's a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst in private practice and is in the faculty of the NYU postdoctoral program in psychotherapy. She is Joe's therapist. Welcome, David. Thank you for holding this discussion with Joe. Thank you both for sharing your personal experience and knowledge with us. We look forward to Q&A session with our audience. If anyone has a question for Joe and or Debbie, please type it into the chat button and we will do our best to get to it at the end of the talk. So let's begin. First question is for Joe. Joe, would you tell us please about your glaucoma journey and what led you to Dr. Waxenberg? Sure. Well, <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you very much, Elena, for everything you've done. And um, you've really revitalized the organization in the most magnificent way. And Debbie, thank you so much for your participation. Um, I was diagnosed with glaucoma uh, in my early 40s. I'm now 77. And um, I'd had elevated pressure um, since my 20s. And uh, I'd been told that that was normal for me not to worry that I did not have glaucoma. But when my pressure reached about 45, my then ophthalmologist thought that was just too much and sent me to, um, to see Dr. Robert Rich who watched me for several decades. Um, and um, I was under his care for a very, very long time. Um, and it's been, it's been quite a journey. Um, you know, at first you don't take it too seriously. And, uh, you know, you think of glaucoma as, a, most of us think of glaucoma as a benign, benign disease where you take a few drops and you're fine. And uh, since you don't really notice any vision loss or may not even have any vision loss at the beginning, you don't pay that much attention. Um, but then a number of years in, you start to notice the loss. And um, uh, I was referred to a low vision therapist. A friend of mine told me about a low vision therapist that I, I had never heard the term before. And I was shocked to find out, it's about 15 years in, and I was shocked to find out how much vision I had lost. And um, the therapist stood across the, 
room for me and had me uh, gaze at her nose and asked me how much of her did I see. And all I could see, I saw her head and her shoulders and I didn't see her again until her hips. And she said, that's how much, wait, how, that's how much uh, vision you've lost. Well, I had never had any idea of that before. And I couldn't understand how I didn't, how that wasn't clear to me. And she explained that the, um, that the mind fills in and uh, tricks you into thinking that you're seeing things that you don't. Um, so it was devastating to me. And I went to see my, my then therapist and I was unable to speak for an hour. I just sobbed uncontrollably. And when I walked out of her office, um, I walked down her long corridor and walked out her front door. And for the first time in two years, I didn't trip on her front stoop because the therapist, the low vision therapist had taught me to look down uh, at, every, at every crossing, at every doorway, at every step. And, um, and I did so and I realized, I laughed actually, and I thought, my gosh, if I learned this much from one session, how much else was there to, for me to learn? And what else, how much better could I be? Um, so that was the beginning of my, um, my exposure to low vision therapy and reaching out for help and getting help, uh, which has been uh, enormously helpful. Then when I did the film, so realizing how much I didn't know, um, I started to ask my doctors about it and they were loath to talk about what happens when the rest of your vision goes. So I started talking to people on the street and um, who were people with dogs and people with canes and I'd offer an arm and say, you know, may I help you and maybe you can help me. And the stories they had to tell were so extraordinary. It was like a secret world. And, and I was rather embarrassed that I had been um, passing these people on the street all my life and that I really had no idea of what their lives were like. And, um, and I thought, this is fascinating, not just to me who was losing his vision, but it's a secret world that most sighted people have no idea of. And that's when I decided to make Going Blind. And uh, it's been a distribution now for 12 years. It's been on public television for it's still in running, uh, part of a 10 year run. <clears throat> and um, we show it regularly in hospitals and medical schools and other institutions and, um, and NGOs. My vision has, um, has worsened dramatically in the last several months. And um, I recently had a shunt put in to lower my interocular pressure. I'd actually lost my reading vision, which was very disturbing. And the shunt um, returned my vision, my reading vision to me, which I was very grateful for. Um, but I am taking accessibility training and um, uh, you know, learning how to use the iPhone and eventually the computer without, um, you know, without being able to read, watch it without, you know, do it without sight. And I'm getting cane trained, uh, which is necessary for me to have a guide dog. So um, it's step by step by step, but it's, uh, it is very daunting and um, devastating and something you have to deal with. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next question is for Debbie. <clears throat> Debbie, what can you tell us about how therapy can help people with glaucoma and maybe even eye care professionals as well? I also want to thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to join in. Um, therapy can be helpful in a number of ways, uh, creating space for dealing with loss and feelings of diminishment around function, independence, sense of identity, which people often feel they have to protect their intimates from and protect a strong face. Therapy can also help differentiate depression from grief, identify strategies for dealing with anticipatory anxiety, and um, emphasizing what strengths people still have, differentiating low vision from low capacity as a person, and differentiating acceptance from resignation. Um, it also creates a space to think about, I mean, often certain kinds of losses or 
moments of vulnerability in our lives can activate earlier experiences of loss and vulnerability. And I think that therapy is helpful for addressing that too. Um, it can help someone tap into, you know, how you see yourself as a person, not just as a patient, but as a, a full person with diminished vision and really help someone tap into their imaginative capacities, not denying the loss, but working within it. For eye care professionals, you know, the focus on the whole person, not only on the medical presentation is crucial. We sort of already touched on that. Really, if you have the time to look at what, what does vision loss mean to them? And I think from, from the care provider's perspective, it's very hard to stay close to the loss of function in someone you care about, especially when, when you're powerless. You know, you can, you can ameliorate it, but there's no treatment for glaucoma. And so to dedicate your professional life to something that kind of doesn't have a future is diminishing for the professional. And often there's um, taboos against professionals getting help and support around that. Um, we have to be able to reckon with our own losses as healthcare providers. Um, to be empathic, we need to lean into those feelings. And I know from the work with Joe, um, my grandfather had period, I, he died before I was born, but he went through periods of, of vision loss. And it really, this experience of working with Joe has helped me go back to my mother who's still alive and find out more about how, how it affected their family um, and, and how that's kind of come through to affect our family also. And, and that's just important. Thank you so much. So beautifully answered. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, Joe, next one is for you. How has glaucoma affected your professional and personal life? And how have things changed over the years? Well, um, honestly, it hasn't affected my professional life very much at all. Um, yeah. I had an interesting experience. Uh, <coughs> I was hired, <coughs> a friend hired me to do a job for a, a, a major Fortune 500 uh, uh, company, a large job that would take quite a long time. And it was a major branding kind of thing. And uh, at our first meeting of our team and their team, she wasn't there. Uh, at the beginning. So I walked in with my, and we hadn't seen each other for quite a while. So we walked in and uh, my team and to meet their team, we sat, we started meeting, throwing ideas around, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when she did finally walk in, um, she walked over to me and she said, hi, Joe, it's Anna Maria. And, but she said it in a way like, I might not know who she was, which I thought was odd. And then I realized she thought that I might have lost so much vision that I wouldn't have recognized her. Hmm. And, and I thought, wow, she hired me thinking that I might have actually lost that much vision that, you know, that, uh, you know, that I would really be to totally dependent on everyone else, vision wise. And I wrote her and uh, called her and said, you know, I realize what you, that, you thought this was a possibility and I just want you to know that we will do we would do just as great a job for you whether I was fully sighted or not and she said I know that that's why I hired you and um it was a tremendous thing and uh I was so I was so impressed by her courage and her um and her and her faith and who I was as a you know, as a person, as a professional, as a, as a filmmaker. And um, uh, th that meant a lot. Sure. But I haven't, um, w one of the things is that I don't, although I have a good deal of vision loss and I've had a great deal of vision loss for a long time, people don't read me as a blind person. You know, it's only recently that I've started to use a cane after I fell down a flight of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> that I didn't see. And um, and I felt that I really needed it to just to remind me 
that I don't see as well as I think I do or as other people may think I do. And, um, but then also recently, as I said, I've been, losing, I've been losing reading vision and that was very disturbing. You know, people from the office would have to, you know, would take at least two of us to go over a document or something. And uh, I felt like there was a tremendous imposition on people and uh, it's diminishing, it's diminishing, but it's, it's stuff you, you, you know, you're, it's a transition, you know, you learn to, you learn to do what you can. And as uh, Jessica Jones in our film says, you learn to use what you have. And, uh, but it takes a while to figure out how to do that. And um, I'm, you know, as many people say in, 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 in this journey, we're still adjusting. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, next one is for Debbie. Debbie, there have been many studies into stress as both a cause and consequence of vision loss. Do you see any evidence of this in practice of psychotherapy? You know, I don't have enough clinical experience to speak to this question with authority. Um, there's so much we still have to learn about the complexities of brain, mind, body relationships. But it makes a kind of enhanced common sense, right? Not just for vision loss, but for all kinds of health experiences. Um, you know, we tighten, our breath becomes more constricted, shallow, blood flow constricts, and that sets up a reinforcing cycle that impacts um, hormonal systems, circadian rhythms, and sleep patterns yes. in all kinds of ways that we just need to be mindful of. So, yeah. Thank you very much, thank you. Can I just add, you know, it's, it's um, someone said it's like you're always in mourning when you're losing vision. And friends who have lost their vision quickly have said that, um, they feel so sorry for me that I've been losing my vision slowly, uh, that it was so much easier for them to lose it quickly uh, because it was done and they adjusted to it within about two months, the major, the major adjustment that is. And, um, and then they could get on with their lives and they couldn't imagine the anticipation of vision loss. Like it would be like constant mourning. And I, of course, have been have valued every moment, uh, every pixel of vision that I've had over the, over this period of time, but it it is um, it, it is a mourning process, and uh, you know, and as Debbie has you know you know talked about you know you know grief and um, you uh, you have to learn how to deal with it, and and it, it requires recognizing it, and I think for physicians also it's very 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 important for them uh, to understand how afraid they are of vision loss, and because if they don't understand it they um, transmit their fear and their shame of not being able to uh, quote, cure uh, a patient. Uh, and I think that gets, that gets um, communicated to the patient in a very negative way. Thank you for that. And, and just to piggyback on that question, Joe, uh, uh, is there anything that you can recommend to our audience today some techniques that you use to reduce anxiety and anything that you can talk about that helped you with your experience? Yeah. Oh, well, the best, um, uh, the best tip I got was, uh, well, was from people in the film, when I was doing the film. Early on, Jessica Jones said, you learn to use what you have. Mm -hmm. And when I said, how long did it take to adjust? She laughed and she said, well, I'm still adjusting four years later. And she would say the same thing now, 20 years later. <coughs> uh, then, but uh, another fellow from the film, Ch Sam Janiskowskis, who was a mobility trainer, uh, a dexterity trainer, uh, explained, said to me, he revealed that he had a disease that could um, take his vision at any time. And, um, and I said, oh my God, how awful. How are you preparing for it? Blah, 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 blah. And he said, hey, listen, Joe, there's something you've got to understand. He said, you can't be preparing for what if, what if, what if all the time. You've got to deal with what is. 
You've got to deal with what you have. If things change, you'll deal with that. Mm -hmm. But um, to be constantly worrying about the future is not serving anyone well, especially you. And he summed me up in a moment because what I had been doing was every time I'd lose a chunk of vision, I would, um, I would get hot and clammy and thinking, oh my God, you know, what else is going to go and how is that going to go and where is it going to go and what will I be able to do? What, I, what, won't, what won't I be able to do? Blah, 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 blah. You know, rather than just absorbing the loss and saying, well, that's not great. Um, but how has it really affected me? Has it really impaired my way of life in any particular way? Usually it didn't. And um, then later on, it started to. And then at, at that point, I had to say, okay, so what's the workaround? Let's figure out the workaround. And that was very, very, very important. And just to learn in the present. You know, I'm taking cane training lessons now. And um, I go to the corner and I can see the light. I have enough vision to see the traffic light. I can see the curb. But I was saying to myself every time I got to the corner, but what if I couldn't see the light? What if I couldn't see the curb? And my trainer said, listen, you've lost enough vision. You qualify. Don't worry. You're plenty blind enough. <laughs> and she, you know, she said, um, if things get worse, we'll train you, you know, about, about it. But in the meantime, the fact that you can see the light is fine. The fact that you can see the curb is fine. You don't have to, you know, um, create the scenario of a worst case scenario. That's so wise. Focus on the present. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Stay in the moment. Uh, next one is for you, Debbie. Is there anything you can recommend to patients and caregivers that might improve a patient's quality of life uh, and the prognosis of glaucoma? Right. Um, so I want to just loop back to stress for a minute, if I can, because I think of course. The, the, that anticipatory anxiety is like you are always being chased by a tiger, right? And in some ways, we, we tend to talk about stress as a kind of monolithic entity, and it, it really isn't. Um, there's, there are some ways of talking about stress that address it uh, arising in the gap between the way we think something should be and the way it is. And uh, that talks about how, how Joe's sort of churning about the what, what if I can't. Um, that, uh, Part of the problem with, with this kind of vision loss is it's not a discrete event where we mobilize stress hormones and then once we can see that the threat has passed, our systems reset. Um, there's always a tiger. It's ongoing, it's progressive, and it's uneven, which makes it even more confusing to, to find adaptation. Um, so that one is always vigilant. And um, so, I mean, Joe sort of already addressed how one, some techniques, breathing, staying in the present moment, tension release exercises, right? Um, there's also, there's um, a pair of twin sisters, uh, Emily and Amelia Nagoski, who talk about burnout particularly, but they also talk about breaking the stress cycle. And they have a TED talk that is, delightful and lively and informative, where they emphasize not self-care, but a kind of kindness and compassion, sort of giving yourself time to find where you are and what you can do, but also creating a circle of connection with others, which is what Joe did, right? Going out, seeking the person with a cane on the street and making, literally making contact, as well as emotional contact. Um, so I think it's really important to have direct, proactive discussions with friends, family, and caregivers, and really bring them in as active partners um, in whatever way that works for you and trying to figure out what you need at a given point in time in the process, what skills and capaci capacities you have, and what areas they think they can best help. Mm -hmm. Pe you know, the people in our lives 
have a wide range of strengths and fragility. Some people are really good at cooking and some people are really good at sitting down and talk, talking with you about what this feels like. So you have to really know your constituency and they have to know themselves well enough to, to really um, be realistic about what kind of help people can offer, including the need to step out when they're overwhelmed. Yeah. And, and really being able to talk about that. Um, that it's important, you know, you have to help them understand that some days your vision's going to be better than others. Um, this is true for things like IBS to carry family loved ones get very confused that one day you can be absolutely fine. And the next day you're bent over in bed. Um, so to really create a space for everyone to have the strong feelings they're going to have that may or may not be shareable. And um, that these that the point is everybody talk with each other in a way to, to ensure as much agency as possible yeah. in the face of something where you don't have, you know, ultimately agency is limited. And that's what my thoughts about that. Thank you very much. Great advice. I think it's, I think it's really important, mm -hmm. super important that you invite people in mm -hmm. and, and you let them, let them know what's going on with you and you because it is very confusing and for your care partners it's very confusing especially and very daunting and it's very important i think to take people's temperatures and to keep them as informed as possible and also to let them know that they they can only do what they can do it may be beyond their ability in which case you, they can cook, <laughs> you know, or, or do something else. Whatever. Yeah. Because I think it is very scary. We are such a visually based culture. <clears throat> Everyone is so afraid. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you both very much. Uh, Joe, as you mentioned before, and I know that as well, that you had the same therapist, uh, the same ophthalmologist, pardon me, for many years. Uh, and he has recently retired from his practice. Can you talk about your search for a new doctor and what did it look like? Oh, that's interesting. Um, obviously, when you've been under somebody's care and you've been very happy with that care, uh, you're not jumping for joy when they announce their retirement. <coughs> but you do know that there are a lot of good people out there. And because of the work that I've done and the advocacy work that I've done, um, I do hear about a lot of about, about a lot of doctors, and um, I had been uh, a number of people had been ref uh, had been referred to and to suggest to see. And um, when uh, well, I was seeing Bob Rich, and then a number of people, um, <coughs> and I and I also <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I was seeing you know, Joel Schumann, who was a friend at NYU, and then Joe passed me on to um, uh, Joe Panarelli at NYU, and um, he did my cataract operation, which was uh, sort of delicate because of the kind of glaucoma that I have. Sorry. <laughs> it's very dry in here. <laughs> And um, I've been, I've been very, I've, I've, I've had very good care. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, maybe <coughs> next, next the last question, and then we'll go into the uh, questions from the audience, is for you, Debbie. Uh, what would you recommend that patients look for in therapists, specifically if they need support navigating a, a health issue? Well, you know, there, there are therapists now who have specialized training in health psychology. That, that is a really burgeoning field. And there's an association of health psychologists that you can look up online and they will help direct you to someone in your area, at least, at least in the U.S. Cool. So that's one route. If that's something that feels particularly salient and important to you that they have. Um, but it's not necessary. I mean, that's not um, 
specialized training that I have, I think anyone who's been practicing psychotherapy for a long time has met people with a range of health issues. Um, and that's not, as, as Joe said, it's not what brought him to therapy initially. Um, so I think it helps if you don't want to go that route to, to talk to people in your network, social network, who have they seen, who have they might recommended, can their therapist recommend somebody, but that ultimately it has to do with a question of fit. And that is so individually determined. I think someone you really, you feel can really listen, um, help you create space for possibility within loss, who can sit with hard feelings, who doesn't rush to solutions. And, and that's a kind of hard to define quality. Um, I think it, it probably helped that um, Joe got my name from someone he loves and trusts. That, that, that sort of um, created a positive aura for us, both directions, because I knew that about you too. Um, so it's, you know, there, I would really stay away from a lot of um, online services now with people who are not well-trained. That's, that's a professional bias on my part. Um, but to really see, work with someone who's had a substantial amount of psychotherapy experience, whether it's specializing in health issues or not. Thank you, thank you, Debbie. You wanna add anything to it, Joe? Well, I think, I think Debbie's right about the fit. I mean, when I first went into therapy years ago, um, I interviewed people for a year before I found somebody that I felt comfortable to see. I mean, there were people that I wouldn't want to be in the same room with. There were people that I wouldn't want to, you know, share a coffee with. Um, and, uh, you know, when I finally did arrive at this particular person, I was in my 20s, and he seemed like an intelligent um, person who was thoughtful and not jumping to conclusions, as Debbie was talking about, and, um, and willing to collaborate and saw it as teamwork. And I liked that. And almost all of my therapists since then have been those kinds of people. Yeah, I think it's about a, a fit. And everybody, of course, is different as to what, what they like. True, that's so true. Well, thank you both so much. These were our prepared questions. And now we'll go into questions from our audience. And there is one question that I see being asked several times. And Joe, can you please talk just a bit about the movie, the name of it, and where it could be found? Apparently, not everybody saw it when the Glaucoma Foundation aired it for our constituency. So please talk about it. Sure. OK. The film is called Going Blind, Coming Out of the Dark About Vision Loss. And you can go to our website www.goingblindmovie.com and you can uh, download it off that website www.goingblindmovie.com I think it's four or five dollars or something yeah thank you thank you and the, and the website by the way goingblindmovie.com is a very informative website it has a lot of resources on it <laughs> <coughs> uh, and Debbie, this question, you also answered it, but would you please repeat it? So the question is that there are waiting lists for therapists. Can you recommend a licensed therapist or professional that are familiar with patients who are blind or have vision loss? And I know you mentioned that there are specific I, health therapists. I think um, I, I imagine places, I, in terms of people with specialization in, in, in working with folks who, are, who have lost their vision, I would imagine the, the Lighthouse would have specific resources. But if you look online at, for the Association of Health Psychologists, um, they can work with referrals. Uh, I, I, I didn't dig really deep into what their offerings are, but that would be a first place. And I don't know, Joe, if, if you have resources on, on the Going Blind website. I haven't looked recently, but yeah. we should have but talked. I, you know, I can, I can do some research and I can let Elena know what I've found and then she can share it with people who are interested. You can okay. do it that way too. Perfect. One place I do know, and, and you mentioned it, Debbie Lighthouse Guild, 
does offer therapy, but it, of course it's local to New Yorkers. They have uh, a few satellites, but it's all in New York State. If it's outside of New York State, and I don't know where uh, the person who asked the question is from, but if you are in New York, Lighthouse Guild is a great resource. The various state commissions for the blind might be good places to try to refer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this next question, I think, uh, both Joe and Debbie should try to answer. Uh, my glaucoma specialist is excellent medically. He brushes aside my fears. My mother was completely blind from the progression of her glaucoma. And although I'm doing well, I'm terrified of following her course. How can I engage him in addressing my fears? Oh, boy. Yes, um, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I, th I, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that everyone is terrified of blindness, everyone, and every individual, every physician, everyone, and physicians maybe carry a, a special fear, because as I say, it represents failure to them. And um, when I talk to when I talk to professionals, when I talk to medical schools, um, I, you know, I try to I, I try to address this and to make them help them to understand that uh, their inability to save somebody from progressive vision loss is not quote failure. You know, that's just the way things are. It's like it's like keeping somebody from aging. You know, you can't you can't do that sometimes. sometimes. <laughs> Usually, um, unless you have a picture in the attic. So um, I think it's very important for the, for the uh, highly trained and paid professional to understand that. And um, uh, I really feel that should be in their training. I think it should be discussed more. And uh, it's, it's, it's very unfortunate to hear, to hear this question um, because it shouldn't be the patient's duty um, to, to have to educate the doctor, but I do think it's worthwhile for her uh, to say, um, I, got, I, have to, I need two minutes to talk to you about this um, because uh, it doesn't, it's not helpful to me and I'm sure it's not helpful to your other patients. Maybe you wanna add anything to it? Yeah, I mean, it occurs to me that I, I agree with Joe. I think here's, it, <clears throat> it takes a lot of gumption to talk back to somebody in a white coat, right? And especially when you're scared and they don't seem to, and, and they're hard to engage around it. But I, I think Joe's suggestion is an excellent one. I think sometimes also in a particular practice, if there's, um, a different kind of person in the practice, sometimes like the assistant or the nurse practitioner in a practice is, is gonna be more available. And I would suss out if there's somebody else in the practice who's knowledgeable, but might be a little more accessible as another option. But I think one of, the, one of our problems, uh, you know, our topic here is, you know, the psychosocial aspects of uh, glaucoma. And I think one of our problems is that these things are not addressed. And this is a perfect example. And the only way to address it is to talk, is to speak up. And that is for each and every patient to say, I am unhappy with this. I'm unhappy that you don't answer my questions. I am unhappy with the fact that you never ask me about how I'm seeing outside of our exam room. I'm unhappy with this. I'm unhappy with that. And um, that's the only way things are going to start to change. I think it's very important. Thank you both very much. So next, it, it's a comment and then a question for Joe. Thank you all for this important webinar. I echo the point about doctors, even ophthalmologists, often being afraid of the reality of vision loss. Uh, Joe, can you talk about the vision in your left eye? There is no vision in my left eye. <laughs> I, I know that, but... Uh, oh, um, I lost my vision. Um, I had a terrible infection in my left eye. My left eye 
had a number of problems for a number of reasons. And uh, I had extremely diminished, diminished and compromised vision in my left eye. And I uh, got an infection in it, probably from sloppy. Um, I was wearing a contact lens to correct corneal edema. And, um, and I was probably sloppy, coffee, sloppy handling of the contact lens. I got a um, terrible infection. And when the infection started to clear, it tore the retina um, uh, off. And um, I chose not to have the uh, eye reconstructed because I just didn't feel there was enough there there uh, to fix. And I was 70 at the time and didn't feel like spending a year or two going through numerous operations and possible infections. I've been enduring an enormous amount of pain and I just couldn't bear it anymore. Um, and when I spoke to the retinologist about my decision, he couldn't very well say, oh, I think it'll be fine. You know, I mean, that it wasn't in that, that you know, it was a case of diminishing returns. Uh, my husband, who was a doctor, was extremely upset about this and my decision. And uh, uh, it caused him tremendous um, uh, anxiety and dissatisfaction. But, you know, he obviously went with it. But um, that's what I chose to do. And uh, so, I, so, but then it puts you in the land of monocularity. And when you're monocular, you're treated very differently than when you have two eyes. And uh, even if you have partial vision in one eye. And um, so there are a lot of steps that we didn't take or put off taking for a very long time, like the cataract removal, um, getting the shunt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, there are trade-offs. My feeling is basically that you have to do what's, what feels right in your gut. You do your, you do your, do, you do your due diligence and you see what, what makes sense to you. And, um, and then if you, if things go well, um, you can say, yay for me. If things go badly, you can say, well, that's what I chose to do. Whereas if you get talked into something that you don't feel good about and things go badly, you're going to be kicking yourself as to, to the fact that you did it. And um, that's how, how I've tried to navigate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question is, uh, are there support groups for people who are blind and how could they find one? So I just want to comment that on the um, Lacoma <laughs> website, <laughs> um, a place that holds patient resources, including uh, connections to uh, available uh, groups for people with vision loss. And we also <coughs> have a support group right on our website for people with glaucoma with uh, severe vision loss. So if uh, Joe and Debbie, you have any other comments uh, about how one find uh, a support group share them. I, I think you are the place to, to start, right? I mean, it's, it's wonderful what the web makes possible for us in terms of finding resources, but you can, but it's also hard to go cold into this territory when you're feeling so vulnerable. You have to become a support and education group at Mount Sinai, right? Yes. Because, yeah. And you also have an online one uh, glaucoma support group right on our website where people can connect to each other and it's it's very easy great um another question about how people can see your movie joe yeah oh um once again uh our link is www.goingblindmovie.com and if you go there and uh, you can download the, uh, the film there um, and stream it. Mm -hmm. um, it's also on public television. It airs every so often. Um, but if you want to see it you know, sooner than later, it just costs a couple, a couple of dollars on that website. Thank you. Uh, 
next question is also for you, Joe. How does monocularity negatively affect you? Oh, where do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, at the, back. <laughs> well, at the beginning, it was quite a shock. Um, I was surprised at what an effect it had on me. I got a cane immediately, immediately, because I totally lost my depth perception and the cane made a big difference. Um, and I never had any of that um, BS problems about feeling sensitive about it or feeling silly or ashamed. Those were never any of my issues. So um, that helped. And I do have a, a German Shepherd dog who's not a trained guide dog, but she was amazingly uh, intuitive and helpful. Uh, I, I would take her into stores and stuff and she really helped me um, along. And then I, and I would find myself, you know, saying to people, you know, I have terrible vision. Can you tell me where the papers are or where the thumbtacks are or whatever? And people were always nice about it. I never had any problems. Um, but oddly enough, after about six months, um, my uh, um, the dimensionality came back. My three dimensionality came back. I don't know how or why, but a low vision ter therapist told me that that's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. And um, I can pretty much judge distances quite well now uh, in a way that I couldn't before. Um, but it's... Uh, you know, I, I, it's not that I'm just monocular. I'm not totally, I'm not totally monocular because my, my one eye doesn't have total vision. Um, uh, it's, uh, I've lost, a, so I'm partially sighted in my, in my one eye. And um, what works, works pretty well, but you have to get what you're looking at within those pixels. And uh, there's a lot of this going on. <laughs> Most of my vision, it's in the upper right quadrant of my eye. Thank you, thank you. Well, we reached the end of our webinar and we've answered all the questions. And I just wanna tell you both that there were a lot of comments thanking you, Joe and you, Debbie, for this insightful conversation. And of course, I wanted to echo all of our constituents' messages, those who wrote and those who didn't, thanking you both for this discussion for your openness, for your willingness to share and talking about this very important issue that is not being addressed enough. I would like to thank our audience for listening to us today. If you will think about the question that you didn't answer, that you didn't ask during our webinar, you can email it to me and I'll make sure that either Joe or Debbie will answer it uh, off hours after the webinar. Uh, Thank you very much. Can I add one more thing? Of course. And 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 that is, um, you know, I'm really grateful for Debbie to, to for participating, and uh, because she certainly didn't have to, she has a very busy very busy schedule. But um, it really it really makes a difference uh, to have um, somebody with uh, that level of. Um, perspicacity in your corner and somebody who can help you look at different the different angles of where you might where you are and where you might be and I've been very fortunate to to have her counsel and I truly recommend um, anyone who's going through these and these are very very difficult times uh, in general and with sight loss makes it all the more difficult and um uh, uh, I make this joke about uh, my husband um, ca catastrophizing everything. And then I say, well, of course, the side loss is a catastrophe, you know, <laughs> but um, it's sometimes important to remember that it is a catastrophe. And, um, and although as, as we try to deal with it and keep ourselves cool, uh, we, may, we may tend to calm ourselves more than is um, appropriate. And uh, it helps to have great people in your corner. It takes a team. And that thank includes you very much. And thank you both. And Debbie, any last words from you? <clears throat> I know. <clears throat> Just to thank you and, and um, wish everyone well. Thank you very much. Thank you both for 
your willingness to share with our audience. Uh, this webinar will be placed on our website, and if anybody wants to watch it again, it will be available tomorrow. Thank you all, and have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. You too. Bye.